Alleluia, alleluia. Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. So Catechesis of the Good Shepherd offers all kinds of gifts. Like for myself, I know intellectually I have grown in my understanding of the Jewish and Christian connections and the meanings of different parts of the Mass and the depth of parables and spiritually and my prayer life and my participation in the Mass, etc., etc. There's just innumerous amounts of gifts that I have been given through this method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. But one really important gift that I have received, and I know many others have received, is the gift of community. Community through the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd community, but also within our own parishes or our own homeschool groups or within our school that we have started this program. Um, The gift, the community of us growing together and depending on one another. So today I want to share with you a really unique story of a community that has come together following the Holy Spirit's guiding to build multiple atria in a very short amount of time, how they supported each other in all these beautiful and tremendous ways, how they grew together and how God used them. I hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome back to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I have Angela Miller here to share with us her very unique story about how Catechesis of the Good Shepherd started in her parish. Angela, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. I live in Ohio. I am a mom of five kids um, here. I belong to Little Flower Parish in North Canton, Ohio. I am working on completing my level three uh, certification, and I currently serve on the board for CGS USA. That's awesome. And how did you get started in the work of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? So we all in our parish came to the work at the same time. We actually had a catechist who was a member of our parish. Um, Her name is Megan Wallenfang. She had previously been trained in, in all the levels of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, and she had been Um, slowly and surely introducing the work to us through our homeschool co-op that we had at our parish, um, as well as gradually integrating it into the faith formation program that we had that was meeting on Sundays, even though it wasn't Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And those of us who were coming into contact with it, so this would have been around 2013, 2014, really were just in awe of it. Not only were the materials beautiful, but we just really got the sense that there was something special with it. And we got this crazy idea that we wanted to offer this to all the children of our parish. And so we started from there. So when you say we, are you talking about Five people, 10 people, how many women are you talking about? Um, So it started small, but it grew pretty quickly. And ultimately it ended up being, and I have to say my husband works as an assistant um, and there is also another husband assistant. So we are not all female, though we are largely, but uh, in total to where we are now, it ended up being 22 catechists and assistants. 14 of them have completed training at least through level one. I love that your husbands have gotten involved in that too. I I think a lot of us as catechists can have slowly brought our husbands in in one way, shape or another. But the fact that your husbands are catechists, what a really neat testimony it is for the boys that are in your atrium. It is. And um, they actually work as assistants in our level three atria. So particularly for that age group of boys, Mm -hmm. we've found it very beneficial. Yes, that is awesome. So your friend, when she brought it to your homeschool group, did she just bring a material and set it in front of you and show you a presentation? Or what did that look like when she introduced it to y'all? It was just a very natural evolution. She didn't bring it in to show 
the parents as in a, hey, look at this really cool thing. Um, she was just using it with our children. And it just very quickly became this beautiful witness that was happening down the hall. And I was teaching science in our homeschool group. And you'd walk past the room and you'd see these children doing a presentation. And they're, they're just so attractive. You want, you know, you want to see it and you want to touch it and you want to be a part of it. So the more we saw it, the more we started pestering her about it. And you wanted to go to formation yourself? And we wanted to go to formation ourselves. So that became something that we really pushed for. And there ended up being a local level one training um, held at a at a par another parish in our community, and started in 2015. That's kind of where we started getting our training. Did you, as a group, approach your priest about the idea of wanting to start it in your parish? We did. So we had a very supportive um, director of religious education at that time, um, who is now in a religious community, and we said, this is beautiful. This is something that we want. We think it's a game changer for our children and for the parish. And the excitement was contagious. And, and we just, we really advocated for it. How did your priest respond? At the time, Father Leo Warline uh, was our pastor, and he was tremendously supportive, even though he honestly was very unfamiliar with the work itself. But he was very open to learning more and to, you know, witnessing the works. Megan would go and she would present works as a meditation at parish staff meetings. Mm. And of course, we would, in, you know, invite anytime there was an opportunity. And so I think it was really characterized by this spirit of openness and willingness to learn more. And then over time, as that was presented, it just grew and grew. So when you started out and your priest was so supportive, which praise God, that is such a blessing that your priest was so supportive of you guys. Did you start off with a permanent space? I think a lot of people imagine that when they start catechesis of the Good Shepherd in their parish, that they need a permanent space with all the materials just for them. Is that how you started off? The first year that we had Atria, we actually did have partially dedicated space. All of the, the works that were done in the co-op or integrated in through faith formation were actually on moving carts that were basically shelving units that could fold in on themselves and be rolled to where they needed to be because largely the, the rooms were structured still as classrooms. When we started our training in 2015, we started in mid-June, beginning of July, I don't remember exactly, we started our atria that fall. <laughs> and so we actually built two level one atria. And one was a, we were given one room that had previously been a faith formation classroom. And then the other was a very, very small room that was actually down the hallway of where our parish staff offices had mm -hmm. been. So it wasn't even a classroom. It had been a small office space. And we converted that as well for our first year. So you made two level one atriums worth of materials in like two months. <laughs> I had to check in with some of my fellow catechists because when I was trying to go back and relive this craziness in my mind, I said, surely, surely we didn't do that. <laughs> but the answer is, is that we did. Now I will say, so Megan had some of the works already that she had previously made and she was willing to pass those on. So we, you know, in some cases, like for example, the, the Good Shepherd, we only had to make and paint one instead of two. We also really focused on staging it. So we didn't have complete mm -hmm. full atria in two months, of course. So we had some transitional works that were 
moved out over time, but we did up and run by September of 2015. Wow. You, you guys were very inspired. I couldn't believe it. My oldest daughter is 11 and a half. She was in Megan's group prior to us actually starting our parish program. And she is now in her final year in a level three atria. So she tells me that she wants to be an atria assistant because she has grown up with that. And I think that that has been a tremendous gift that we have been able to give our kids. Praise God. How did you approach people in finding more catechists? So for us, it was really a work of evangelization. Though we did do mass communications, of course, the success of what we did, I believe, is that it was all based on personal invitation. Mm -hmm. Those of us who had seen the goodness of the work, had seen its impact on our children, on ourselves, and, you know, we had seen the good news and we, mm -hmm. we wanted to share that with people. And so you would have a mom who would go to another mom and say, you know what, we have this thing and I want to, and I want to talk to you about it. And I think what made the difference is that instead of seeing it as, oh my gosh, there's this other volunteer opportunity and somebody else is asking for my time and my resources and I don't know if I can do it, people saw people who looked like themselves, who believed in the work so much that we were willing to make those sacrifices, but also support each other in a way that made it doable. Even if you were working, even if you had a bunch of kids at home, even if you were homeschooling, even if you were pregnant or nursing or um, going through any life challenge, our community was the ticket. It was the place where we were all gathering around the work. We were inviting people to join us. And then when they said yes, we were willing to do what was necessary to support them and to love them through whatever needed to happen to make that possible. Can you give some tangible examples of what you mean by doing anything necessary to help them? In this time, we've done a lot of different growth areas in parish ministry outside of just catechesis of the Good Shepherd. One of those things is meal ministry. And that started before that, it was just us. And so when people would have a baby or they had a child who was sick or a family member that was going through a tough time. We would set up a meal train and we would bring them meals. When I would need to go to training, I wouldn't have childcare because my husband couldn't take off work. And so my fellow catechists would take my children. They'd kind of rotate through. So I'd be gone for a week and I'd have three of my fellow catechists who are basically running camp in their homes for my children. My husband would drop them off and they would play. Our parish was supporting financially training. A lot of us were already investing not only our time, but our financial resources in making a lot of these works. And so our parish was really working financially to try and also support that as well. And a lot of it too was just emotional encouragement and prayer and sending out little reinforcements, little encouragements whenever it was hard or whenever we're like, are we really sure we could do this? And somebody was always there saying, yep, and I'll help you. Mm, I love that. I think that so many people can relate to the the struggle of finding more people to help or um, maybe being intimidated by starting an atria because who is going to help me? How I need a community. But it sounds like what you guys did was that build a community. You didn't just say, hey, we need help. You reached out and said, I see you. I see your needs. I see your wants. I see your desires. Let me show you this thing that can feed your soul. Let me help you feel a part of this community that we have created. And in that you're feeding somebody, not just um, needing them for their time and abilities. I love that y'all created such a beautiful community. And we didn't want it to stop with us. So pretty much anywhere any of our CGS folks were in the parish, 
we were bringing little pieces of the work with us. My husband and I, for a time, were also involved with our adult faith formation. Specifically, we were hosting an alpha program, which is, for those who don't know, a uh, a meal-based faith sharing program that really is designed to introduce the gospel to people who perhaps are unfamiliar with it and kind of bringing in those implements, bringing it into our faith formation programs, to RCIA, to baptism prep, even if it was just, here's this great written resource that we have, or we're going to come to your meeting and we're just going to lead the reflection time and we're going to do the work and really letting people see and experience and share in fundamentally the the wonderful things that were happening with us. Did y'all have any bumps on the road? <laughs> yes. Obviously, despite how blessed we have been, and there is no doubt that we have absolutely been so abundantly blessed, we've faced a lot of the struggles that every other parish or group may experience trying to implement something new. We had voices in the parish in the beginning that were skeptical, let's say, about the methodology. You know, we don't have books. How are we going to assess them? Mm -hmm. You know, what does bean counting have to do <laughs> with faith formation? Why are they sweeping the floor? You know, all of those things. We also, as we've grown, we have taken over faith formation up through fifth grade at our parish. So from age three to fifth grade. And so that's required a lot of flexibility and a lot of patience on everyone's part, because as a growing parish, space is always a concern. Mm -hmm. And the more space we permanently convert to fixed atrium space, that's space that isn't used for something else. And so we've had to be in a lot of negotiations with that about how we can support it. And there's been a lot of need for, for education because it was so new and including as we've done capital campaigns and trying to raise money for the parish to expand our space, consistently providing demonstration of the value and meaningfulness of this work. Mm -hmm. So doing like what you were talking about of going into meetings yeah. and formations and baptism classes and such. And and we also have done little displays in the narthex in the back of the church where we would actually, because our classroom building is separate from our church building, so bringing works physically to that space so that people who maybe don't have young children and never get over to that building would have the opportunity to see the works and to look at the materials and talk to a catechist. We've done blurbs in our bulletin. We have done podium-based uh, announcements mm -hmm. and, re and reflections, open houses. <laughs> Our approach was we weren't closed off to any idea, that we would, we would consider it and we would go and we would meet people where they were. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've kind of had this open door policy, but if people weren't going to be willing to come to our atriums, we were going to bring the work to them and we were going to show them. And I really believe in not only the work we do as CGS USA, but as all of us as catechists, this really is what our world needs, not only from the sense of community, but really giving our hurting world a sense of place and of purpose mm. and of connection mm. uh, in the in the whole plan of God. And as I've progressed in my training and really been exposed to all the wisdom and treasures that, that are kind of contained within CGS mm -hmm. um, and CGS USA, I, I don't think that there's any part of what I do, including my work as a psychologist, that isn't different. I now have four children who are in the atrium. 
and in all levels. My youngest is a three-year-old in the atrium, and it's changed how we talk about God as a family. Their relationships are so strong and so beautiful. And you know, I, I mean, I could go on forever. I couldn't say enough positive things about the difference it's made in our life. I love what you were saying about the depth of knowledge that you've been able to, as you've done more and more formation, I have felt the same way. I feel like the more I have learned, it's almost like how we talk about the parable method. And as you grow older, you know, the parable of the mustard seed means something different. The more you read it or different times in your life, I feel like CGS kind of has the same type of um, characteristic that it has like it a does. parable method. The more formation that I do, I'm like, oh, it goes deeper. Oh, it goes deeper. Like, oh, <laughs> it, it is. It's always, but wait, there's more. Oh, wait. And, you know, and how great that God loves us to the extent that, that he is still speaking in such a living and dynamic way and meeting mm -hmm. all of us. It's, it's just beautiful. It is beautiful. And one of the things I think that can really happen in the formation of, of the catechist is the sense of inclusion. For those of you who don't know Megan Wallenfang, she is one of those catechists who it, it's almost like the catechesis of the Good Shepherd just flows mm -hmm. from her. It's so conducive um, or so... Um, what I would call as a psychology, egocentric. It, it is exactly who she is. It mm -hmm. fits her temperament. It fits her personality. She talks CGS. I'm pretty sure she breathes CGS. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And she's probably highly embarrassed that I'm saying this because she's also very humble and, and a beautiful soul. Um, and there are many in, of my friends that are like that. If you don't know me, you will know that I am not like that. Um, I am a very different temperament. I just tend to be, you know, that part choleric, kind of out there. I'm going to charge forward. I'm going to do these things. Probably wouldn't choose verbs like gentle or meek or adjectives rather to describe myself. And when I came to the work, I was like, I don't know about this because it challenged me in such a dramatic way. And I think of all the false starts I had learning level one and to let go of that, that teaching mentality and, and to do all of that. And the more information I had, the more time I sat with the child and learned alongside them and learned from them, the more I could see that there is a place for everyone. And it's simply a willingness to say yes, that there isn't one temperament that is completely excluded from the work um, and that can't learn and can't grow in this way, that all of these things have been given to us for this use and that we can be equipped and we can be formed that's been an amazing gift as well. Angela, I can totally relate to everything that you're saying because I also have a personality very similar to yours. I am much faster paced and louder than a, a typical catechesis, catechist should be. And so I remember as I was being formed, being like, oh, I need to be even slower than that. I thought I was going slow. Oh, I need to be quieter. I thought I was being quiet, you know. But I agree with you that that it calls all of us and it has a growth within all of us, no matter what our natural personality is. And, and I think each of us, whether we are seem to be that natural, calm, quiet personality or the faster pace like us, we each have different gifts that we're bringing to the table. And like we say, the good shepherd is calling us each by name. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Amen. Angela, is there anything else about your story that you would like to share? You know, I, I think that I'm just excited to see where it goes next, that just like we hear the words anew, we read each parable in, in a new way as we go on, 
the same is true for the work that we're doing. And it's the one thing that I am constantly called to remember by my fellow catechists and my friends is to take that listening stance and to keep going back to prayer and going back to scripture and and really listening for what we're called to next and, and being open to what that might look like. Well, I'm so grateful that you are sharing your story. I hope that it inspires others. Angela, before we finish, I would like to ask you, has there been a time in your years in catechesis with a child or with a material, with an adult maybe, where you felt that, wow, this work, it really works? So I've been really fortunate to have uh, multiple examples of that. And I think all of us can say that if we're paying attention, that those moments are happening. But the one that, that came to me right away when you asked me the question actually had to do with my son. Uh, my son, Joshua, is eight and a half years old, and he has grown up in the atrium. And in 2018, in the fall, my father-in-law um, his grandfather passed away unexpectedly. And at our parish, children, unless the catechist requests it, are usually, if their parent is a catechist, in a, in a different atrium than the one that their parent is a catechist in. And so I was very blessed. My, my son was in the atrium of one of my best friends. And that day when we learned that he passed away, we were actually outside the home. And as soon as we got home, uh, my son ran upstairs to his bedroom and I let him go up there and, and have some quiet time. And after a while, I went up to check on him. And when I went up there, he had gotten out all of his colored pencils and some paper, and he drew this beautiful drawing. And in this drawing were all of these images from the atrium, and it included the parousia and the wheat and the the Eucharist and, and all of these different things all over it. And he wrote his grandfather's name in the middle of it. And it really struck me because I, you know, I said, Josh, you know, what are you doing? And and he said, Well, I just I, I wanted to I wanted to draw. And he started talking to me about it and he basically said that he was drawing that time when we were going to be all in all and that we could still be with my father-in-law in the Eucharist. Mm. And, you know, this is not something that I coached in him. This is not something that I explicitly taught. This came directly from his relationship with the Holy Spirit and the time in the atrium. And he synthesized in such a beautiful way so many of the works to help him understand the most profound loss he had ever experienced. And it just took my breath away. And so we all have the opportunity to share uh, writings and artwork from the children uh, with the journal as an inspiration. I encourage everyone to look at that. Um, and in fact, Joshua's drawing, if you would like to see it, was published in our most recent journal of the Catechesis, the Good Shepherd USA. It's amazing. It's amazing what this work does. Wow. That is amazing that he was able to find hope in the promise of the Eucharist and parousia in such a time of fear and loss. That is, that's an inspiration to all of us as we experience that, that, you know, may we follow like children. It was having that context from the atrium, my children, even the ones who were old enough to have a, a more sophisticated understanding of death and loss were very, fundamentally joyful. And I even remember them asking, you know, well, why are, why are you sad? And I said, well, I'm sad for us. 
because we miss him right now in this moment. But isn't it beautiful what you're showing us that that we share and that connection we have? And I think that's one of the things that among among so many that the catechesis of the shepherd, good shepherd does so well is it fosters again that sense of connection, that sense of meaning, that sense of purpose, that freedom to engage in that in whatever way the child and the adult Mm -hmm. is ready that's really beautiful that's really beautiful that your children were able to kind of guide you guide your family towards the hope the truth that they already seem to know so deeply they are our best ambassadors Mm -hmm. thank you angela for sharing thank you so much for sharing your whole story with us i really appreciate you Mm, thank you for having me Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. If you have any questions about how to start Catechesis of the Good Shepherd in your church or in your school, please contact us. We are here to help you. There is also a lot of really helpful information about starting Catechesis of the Good Shepherd on our website, cgsusa.org. As advocates for the children's spiritual life, we are always looking to share their artwork because it offers us a glimpse into the child's conversation with God. If you have seen this in the artwork of your children, please share with us. You can find the form to be submitted with the artwork in our show notes. We would love for you to join us every other Wednesday, so please subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends and share on social media about the podcast. Help us get the word out there. You can find the podcast on any app where you can find podcasts. We are there. Please consider rating us and giving a comment about the podcast. They are tremendously helpful. We read every single one. Tell us what you think in your ideas. You can also email us at cgs at cgsusa.org. Please keep up with CGS USA on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I put our name for each of those platforms down in our show notes. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We want to thank all the contributing members of the association because you are making this podcast possible. If you want to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you for joining us. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.